I'm in love right now. I first met her a long time ago when she had a brief stay at the Frick Museum before she had to return home to Puerto Rico. Eight years passed by and I nearly forgot all about her. But as luck would have it, I just ran into the girl again in New York City at another museum. This time I saw her at the Met. Her name is June, Flaming June. She is a ravishing maiden, eternally aglow in the hot Mediterranean sun. Her gauzy citrus gown, melted by the late afternoon heat, entangles her body much like the drapery on a Greek Venus. Warmth radiates from her flushed cheeks while her languid figure sprawls, exposed by the sheer fabric of her dress made transparent, almost wet by the humidity. Endlessly asleep and so oblivious to our gaze, Flaming June remains innocent. She embodies sensuality without being erotic. We're drawn to her, yet unable to stir her, the pinnacle of private peace. Flaming June was created and conceived by Frederick Lord Leighton at the end of his life. For him, June culminates his lifelong credence in art for beauty's sake. Leighton's predecessors, the Pre-Raphaelites, would disagree with such a belief. Their works were narrative in nature, illustrating literary and biblical stories. But like fellow artists and artisans of the ascetic movement, Leighton instead looked to models in antiquity for lessons in modeling pure beauty. Rapunzel-like auburn hair encircles her, barely containing her complex but utterly relaxed pose within the chosen square form. An awning at the top, mimicking the tabernacle frame chosen by the artist, shelters his subject and his viewer in the flat light away from the direct sun. Then, in shocking contrast to the nearly invisible brushstrokes and smoothness of the rendered figure, the sparkling sea is activated with bold brushstrokes, electrifying the distant space beyond on the horizon. When I saw her again last week, I had the same reaction I did so many years ago. I became mesmerized, taken in, and for a few moments, the rest of the world evaporated around me. In the middle of a bustling gallery at the Met, I stood alone, feeling the heat radiating off this masterpiece before me, and like the innocent young woman, I too felt flushed by my own intoxication. As an art dealer and collector, my first coherent thought following this moving experience was gratitude, not only for the opportunity to see this treasure again, but also because I knew that this painting possessed the power to change trends. There has been a disappointing lack of interest recently in the realist gems of the 19th century, but anyone who stands before this painting is simply unable to dismiss the genius before them. I'm always as curious about a painting's history of ownership as I am about the works themselves, painted in 1895, shortly before the artist's unexpected death. It did not make it as planned to the Paris Salon that year until later in 1900, which led to subsequent exhibitions. But by the 1960s, it was lost and had fallen into obscurity. When it finally resurfaced, it came to the market when interest in these works, similar to the mood today, was out of fashion. The painting failed to sell at auction, enabling Luis Ferre to snatch it up in 1963 for less than $200 on a buying trip to London. He spotted a masterpiece and brought it home to Puerto Rico, where it has remained the centerpiece of his family's museum ever since.